Have you ever watched ants? <clears throat> I mean, really carefully watch them as they explore your kitchen or raise your picnic? I used to love watching ants as a kid, but I really became fascinated by them as a graduate student when I started learning more about their biology. What blows my mind, and one of the reasons that I've continued studying ants for almost 20 years now, is that many of the things that I thought people invented, the use of tools, agriculture, medicine, were also invented by ants long before humans even existed. So perhaps rather than just watching and admiring ants, maybe we can actually learn a thing or two from them. One of the things that ants and humans have in common is that we both have complex societies. In our human societies, we rely on division of labor to get things done. We have teachers, scientists, entrepreneurs, engineers, construction workers, architects. And collectively, we benefit from this division of labor because no one of us could accomplish all of these things on our own. Ant societies also rely on division of labor. In every ant colony or society, there's the same basic division between the queen and the workers. The queen's job is to lay eggs, and that's pretty much all she does. The workers perform all of the other tasks that the colony needs to do, from building and maintaining the nest, finding food, rearing the young, and protecting the nest from enemies. And in many ant species, this is something that all of the workers do. All workers are performing all of these tasks. So recently, I've been doing research with an undergraduate student here at Rice named Alice Gong on a species of aphenogaster ants that use tools to collect food. So let's say you're having a picnic and you drop a little bit of jelly out of your peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Well, within a few minutes, one of these aphenogaster workers might show up and drop a little piece of dried soil or a dried leaf into the jelly. And a few minutes later, another one arrives and does the same thing. Soon after that, those workers will return and retrieve those little bits of debris, which by then have soaked up the jelly like a sponge, and they'll carry that back to their nest and use it to feed their babies. Now, what Alice's work is showing is that in an aphenogaster colony, all of the workers are capable of using tools to collect food but some of them are more likely to do so than others. But in other ant species, this division of labor is even more extreme. In this species of turtle ants, within a colony, some of the workers have a circular disc on their heads that's just the right size to plug up the hole that forms the entrance to the nest that these ants build in twigs. It acts as a living door. If one of the other workers wants to enter the nest, it taps on the ant's head, the door opens, and the ant enters. In these honeypot ants, some of the workers act as living food storage vessels. Other workers will go out, find food, gobble up as much as they can, return to the nest, and then regurgitate it into the mouths of these specialized workers called repletes. And these repletes just keep getting bigger and bigger as their bodies fill with food. But if there's ever a shortage of food, the repletes can then regurgitate that food back into the mouths of all the other workers in the colony, ensuring that no one ever goes hungry. Now, in our human organizations, we rely not only on division of labor, but also on hierarchical structures, whether it's governments, militaries, schools, or corporations. Human organizations have a leader or group of leaders who oversee the work of others, who in turn oversee others. Ant societies aren't organized this way. The queen isn't really a queen at all. She doesn't rule over the workers. She doesn't tell them what to do. And she certainly doesn't punish them if they misbehave. She just lays eggs. And because there are no leaders, there can't be any corruption. There are no dictators. There's no such thing as an abuse of power. <coughs> Now, interesting thing about some of these worker ants, they're also the daughters of the queen. The queen is the mother of all of the worker ants. So unlike in our human organizations, an ant society is also a family. And because all of the workers are the daughters of the queen, they're all female, that means they're all sisters. 
It's an entirely female-dominated society. But from an evolutionary point of view, being all sisters means that they share a lot of the same DNA. So they actually have a vested interest in cooperating. And because of a quirk of ant genetics, the worker ants can actually be more closely related to one another as sisters than they would be to their own offspring, which may help explain why they evolved to help the queen to make more sisters rather than to reproduce themselves and have their own babies. Now, in some ant species, even distantly related individuals are treated as if they were family. A mutation in the genomes of red imported fire ants has caused some of them to lose the ability to tell whether another fire ant is its sister or not. So they've defaulted to just accepting any other fire ant they encounter as if it belonged to their family. This is very unusual among ants. Normally, if ants from different colonies encounter one another, they fight to the death. But if they have this mutation, they just treat any other fire ant as if it belongs to their family. And the result of this is very interesting. In places where this mutation occurs, the red imported fire ants have become the dominant ants in the area. <coughs> Think about that. By treating all other individuals as family, these ants have accomplished more together than they would have been able to do if each family just looked out for its own interests. Just think about what we humans could accomplish if we all treated one another as family. Another lesson we might be able to learn from ants is how to manage traffic. So this is a trail of leaf cutter ants. These ants have cut pieces of leaves and they're bringing them back to the nest. And during rush hour, there could be tens of thousands of ants going back and forth along this highway. But they never have traffic jams. How can that be? Recently, I started collaborating with a team of physicists to try to understand how leaf cutter ants avoid traffic jams. We've set up video cameras along their foraging trails in the rainforests of Costa Rica. And then we introduce obstacles, like a metal sheet with just a thin opening that allows one worker at a time to pass through. Now, I can guarantee if something like this happened on one of our highways here in Houston, <laughs> traffic would be backed up for miles and it would last for hours. But somehow, these ants quickly figure out the fastest way around the obstacle. And as soon as one or two ants do that, all the other ants follow, and the normal flow of traffic resumes. Imagine if we could model our driving behaviors after what these ants are doing. <laughs> we might actually be able to do this if we figure out more about what the rules these ants use are. Perhaps we could design programs for self-driving cars that would eliminate traffic altogether. Actually, computer scientists have already been trying to design programs that are modeled after the behavior of ants. Since the 1990s, computer scientists are working on trying to figure out how it is that ants are so good at finding the shortest distance between their nests and sources of food. What we know is that they do this by letting other ants know where they've been with the use of chemical pheromones. And the ants tend to always follow whichever path is the strongest pheromone trail. So even if the first ants out of the nest choose their path randomly, the ants that follow behind it are likely to follow the shortest path because over a given period of time, more ants will have gone back and forth along the shortest path, so it accumulates the most pheromone. Using a similar approach with virtual ants and virtual pheromones, computer scientists are designing algorithms that can not only allow a delivery person to find the shortest distance uh, the shortest route that would connect all of the addresses on their lists, but also to design the most efficient wireless networks. We might also be able to learn a thing or two from the way that ants have conducted agriculture. Now, human agriculture began about 10,000 years ago, but we still run into the same problem, and that is that the most efficient way to grow a lot of food for a lot of people is to use a monoculture to grow a whole lot of the same crop in a particular area. But every time we do that, we become vulnerable to pests and diseases that attack those crops. In the 1840s, a pest, uh, a pest known as the um, uh, a blight, it was a fungus known as blight, started to attack the potatoes that were being grown in Ireland. 
And at the time, it was a monoculture. Only a single variety of potato was being grown. And that variety happened to be susceptible to the blight. That resulted in more than half of the crops of potatoes being wiped out in just a few years. And more than a million people died in what became known as the Irish potato famine. In the 20th century, a similar fate happened to the world supply of bananas. Prior to the 1950s, the primary variety of banana being grown commercially was a type known as the Gros Michel banana. And these Gros Michel bananas were great for shipping around the world. They grew really well, but they were susceptible to a fungus known as Panama disease. This nearly wiped out the world supply of bananas. The solution was to switch to a different variety of banana, known as Cavendish banana. And this is probably the bananas that you're most familiar with, the thing that you're most likely to find in your supermarkets. But the problem is, although they weren't vulnerable to Panama disease at first, we still keep growing them in monocultures. And now a new strain of Panama disease has emerged that is attacking Cavendish bananas and threatening to wipe them out. So the lesson is that it's very difficult to grow crops as a monoculture. And yet, somehow, this is what some ants are able to do. This is a picture of me standing next to a particularly lovely nest of leafcutter ants in Venezuela. And inside of this enormous nest are thousands of chambers, each about the size of a volleyball. And these chambers are filled with fungus that these ants are growing as their own crop. It's a domesticated fungus that can't live outside of the nests of these ants. And these ants depend on it as their only source of food. But if you look at all of the thousands of chambers inside of this nest, they all have genetically identical crops. It's a monoculture. These ants have been growing crops like this for millions of years. So how have they managed to avoid the problems that we have with pests? Well, they seem to have a secret weapon. And that is what you see growing all over the surface of the body of this leafcutter ant. That white substance that you see is actually bacteria. There are so many bacteria growing on this ant's body that you can see it with the naked eye. But this ant is not safe. These bacteria are actually producing pesticides that keep the garden that the ants are cultivating from pests that can attack it. Now, we also use pesticides in our agriculture, but the problem we face is that every time we apply a new pesticide, the pests evolve resistance to it. So we're engaged in an arms race. And it's one that we're not winning. So what do the ants do differently? By growing live bacteria, these bacteria are able to evolve along with the pests. So every generation of bacteria can produce better and better pesticides. If we could take a, a page from the ants' playbook and try to treat bacteria and other microorganisms not as uniformly bad germs, but with a more nuanced view that recognizes that some of them can actually be beneficial we might be able to solve some of our agricultural problems and perhaps some of our health problems as well. So far, we've seen how we might be able to learn from ants about how to design organizations without a leadership hierarchy, how to manage traffic without slowdowns, and how to manage agriculture without running into the problems of pests. I think there might be one more lesson that we can learn from ants. And that's a lesson about resilience. In August of 2017, Hurricane Harvey struck southeast Texas and brought record amounts of rainfall. As much as 60 inches of rain fell in some areas here in just a few days. This brought devastating flooding to, school, to schools, homes, and businesses around the region, and an estimated $125 billion of damage. My home was one of thousands that flooded. My wife and I were home with our three children at the time that the rainwaters first entered our home at about 5 o'clock in the morning. And by dawn, our home was filled with almost two feet of dirty brown water. The rain was still falling, and we weren't sure how much deeper it would get. So we decided to try to make it to high ground. My wife and I each put our youngest kids on our shoulders. We borrowed an inner tube from the neighbors and floated our oldest, who was seven, down the street, trying to make it to high, high ground. We didn't make it far because the water was way too deep in the streets. But along the way, we encountered other evacuees, fire ants. <laughs> Amazingly, these fire ants can form living rafts by linking their bodies together. And this allows the colony to escape during floods. 
These ants were doing the exact same thing that we were doing. In the middle of this raft is where they keep their babies, the eggs and the larvae. And this raft can float for hours or days until it reaches high ground where they'll rebuild their homes. As devastating as Hurricane Harvey was to my family and so many others in this region, it was also an opportunity as a scientist for us to understand how other species like ants can be so resilient in the face of change, to understand how they're affected by such an extreme natural disaster. It just so happened that my colleagues and I had been studying ant communities in the parts of Southeast Texas that ended up being the hardest hit by Hurricane Harvey before the flood, so we could go back to those same places and look at how those communities were different. Now we expected that the fire ants might not be too badly affected because they can form rafts, but most ant species can't do that. So we thought we would see big impacts of the floods on the other 35 species of ants that live in this area. But amazingly, that's not what we've seen. Based on our data so far, we've seen just a short temporary dip in the ant populations right after the flood. They quickly got back to work and rebuilt their communities. And within a year, they looked exactly the same way they had before the floods. We're still trying to understand how it is that ants that can't build rafts are able to be so resilient in the face of change. But given that two and a half years after Hurricane Harvey, my family is still rebuilding our home, as are many of our neighbors, it seems clear to me that we still have a lot that we can learn from watching ants. Thank you.